Throughout my adult life, my focus has been on making the world a more beautiful place. Initially, I pursued this goal as a hairstylist, working on the external appearance of individuals to make them feel more beautiful. However, I wanted more, so I began to shift my focus to helping people make better choices and achieve greater beauty from within. As a transformational life coach, I specialize in helping you identify and change the limiting beliefs that may be holding you back. Join me each week as we discuss, interview, teach, and explore the fundamental principles of healthy relationships. Welcome to Conscious Conversations with Louisa. In today's episode of Conscious Conversations with Louisa, I'm speaking with Greg Reed. Gregory does not know this, but a year ago, I was on a mastermind with him and I was asked, I got, had an opportunity to ask him a question and your feedback to me was start a mastermind. And so I went ahead and started a mastermind. So how many people in here have had amazing experience with me for the last year? You can thank the wonderful gentleman for that because he literally like that day when we were in a session just like this, you said you should probably start a mastermind. And here it is. So all of the amazing people I've had on, all of the remarkable experiences we've had has been because I heard what you said. I took in the fact that there was a moment where you just like stop looking for permission and just go, if someone sees that I could do it and says that I could do it. So listen from a place of what can happen today and what you can move forward and take on in your life. And that's the reason we're here. One of the things that the only thing we're doing differently that I also learned from Greg Greed is I do the introduction of all of your amazing things that you've done. And I'm not spectacular at that. So David Reed happens to be fantastic at that. So he's going to be the one introduced. <laughs> that's right. Well, if, 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 wait, before we go down that rabbit hole, you know, it's so cool because a mentor taught me something uh, many years ago. It says the greatest way you enter, you, uh, you honor your mentor is by applying the information and content given to you. And I remember it stuck with me like crazy. And I went to Les Brown because I wanted to be a greater public speaker. And I said, Mr. Brown, I go, would you do me a favor? Just give me one tip, one nugget of what I could do to help my speaking career. And he did. And I did something crazy. I actually applied it. I hunted him down a month later. He says, Mr. Brown, I met you a month ago. I asked for a nugget. You gave it to me. I go, I did it. Here's my results. What should I do next, sir? And he was so shocked that someone actually took action. He and I are talking and chatting nonstop. And now we become each other's mentors. And it's that one simple action of the law of attraction that makes our dreams a reality. And you're just a good testament of doing just that. I, well, I have to say there's one more thing then, because when I heard you speak, one of the reasons I absolutely, so for me, if it's not a heck yes, it's an F no. And when you were speaking, what you did was say everything that you were doing and how incredible it was. And then you turned around and explained how and what. And I was like, oh, my God, he's not just telling us what to do. And he's not just talking to us. You turned around and explained it. And that was a heck yes for me. So then when you introduced Secret Knock, I swear to God, didn't know when, didn't know if I, anyone was going to watch my children, didn't know how much. I just signed up for it. So one of the things I'd love for you to share today is that level of enrollment, that level of beingness that creates action like that. So now I will be quiet for 30 seconds and have David... Like, well, that's <clears throat> all right, Greg. I hope I do you proud. All right, get ready to meet Greg Reed, a man who's accomplished more in his life than most of us could ever dream of. Greg's been an inspiring, been inspiring people for over 25 years, and his life work has been recognized by government leaders, a foreign princess, industry luminaries. With over 100 books published, including 32 bestsellers in 45 languages, Greg's titles such as Stickability, The Millionaire Mentor, and Three Feet from Gold are sure to leave you feeling motivated and ready to take on the world. As a founder of Secret Knock, a top-rated event focused on partnership, networking, and business development, Greg is always at the forefront of the entrepreneurial world. He's even produced an Oscar-qualified film, Wishman, st- streaming on Netflix, which is based on the creator of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. But that's not all. Greg's contributions extend beyond entrepreneurship with his work in mentoring youth in San Diego, earning him recognition from the White House. 
And to top it all off, Greg has even been recently honored with a star on the Las Vegas Walk of Stars. Talk about a Hollywood ending. <laughs> that was fantastic. Yeah. And by the way, the least qualified guy in the world for all that stuff. So <laughs> that's the greatest thing about it. So for those of you who are new to me, I'm Greg. I'm here in San Diego, California. I've done now 100. I've been published in 145 books, 45 languages and all that good stuff. But I'm dyslexic. I can't spell, read or write very well. If you play me words with friends, you'll win every single time. So I learned you work your strengths and you hire or you partner with your weaknesses. So I teamed up with amazing ghostwriters who could take my words and then craft them in a way that people would want to read it. And that's one of the reasons I absolutely loved you because I was like, you know what? He shared all of the things he's got as a possible ouchie and then look at everything that you can accomplish from there. So I'm like, oh, I have this. I, I have all of those things that like, might not work, but he did it so I could do it. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And, and, and none of it's rocket science. I mean, it, it, even when you talk to rocket scientists, it's not rocket science. And it's just a matter of the application. Uh, one of, the, one of the, my favorite interviews was a guy named Peter Diamandis who started the X Prize. And I remember after a three hour interview, I was leaving and he said something that just completely changed my paradigm. He says, Greg, while you and your friends are doing admirable things and trying to do everything possible, to make this world a better place. He goes, me and my friends are doing everything possible to get off of it, to create the perfect planet somewhere else. Talk about just a mind shift, right? Absolutely. But it didn't start all that far ahead for you. So you grew up in the mean streets of San Diego. Del Mar, a beach community. It was a rough life growing up. I was in a street gang called the Del Mar Posse. At night, we break into Maseratis and then detail them. We're a real tough group. Yeah. I freaking love it. And so what was it like? Um, what was young Greg like? Who, who's young Greg? Yeah, Greg, same Greg is now full of crap. Talker guy got in trouble as a kid. And now you get rewarded for it. You know, as a kid, you get in trouble for making up stories. And now people throw trophies at me. So go figure. <laughs> it's kind of one of the funniest things about how the uh, serendipity of things come to be. But I, I was I was a young, aspiring, you know, entrepreneur. Even as a kid, I wanted to have all this nice stuff, but I couldn't get a job. So what I did is I took the lawnmower and I went neighbor to neighbor and I got the neighbors to pay me $10 to mow their yard, and then I'd hire the other kids in the neighborhood for five bucks to mow the lawn for me. And again, I remember getting in trouble, getting yelled at because I'm taking advantage of the kids. Yet again, I was just being an entrepreneur at an early age. So one of the reasons I love doing these interviews is because there's always a common denominator and every young person has shared that with us. I mean, everyone started as an entrepreneur, even as a kid. And I know that your son kind of pulled one of those too. And when you asked him to clean his room and all of a sudden everybody else was doing it, what was that story? Because he is. Yeah, yeah you got to be careful what you say to these kids because they actually listen to it sometimes, even when they act like they're too cool. But it's kind of one of those interesting things. And, and, and before I tell that story, I, I'll do a preface. My, my son, he's amazing. He's 11 years old. Really cool kid. Everyone loves our kid. Here's what's a little bit different about him. When he was a child, he's now 11. But when he was a child, seven, he had the number one album on Amazon for spoken word. How crazy is that? So he would always do these mantras. And at night before he goes to bed, he goes, my name's Colt. I'm, how I'm powerful. I'm brave. I'm wise. I'm worthy. I'm successful. I help people. And then a buddy of mine put hip hop music to it. And it went on and he started his own Spotify channel, you know, when he was seven years old. Um, go figure, right? But I remember I was doing a podcast and this might be a paradigm shift for people. But the, the podcast person said, do you give your kid money allowance to do things he doesn't like to do around the house, like pull weeds and make his bed. I said, absolutely. I go, I'm going to teach my son the power and respect of money. And she goes, stop, stop, stop. She goes, that's too bad that you're ruining your child for the rest of his life. And right there I went, teach me. And she said something so prolific, it changed everything for me. She goes, think about it, Greg. She goes from the earliest of memory, you're training your child the only way to make money is to do something they don't like to do. And I went, wow. I go, well, you know what? I said, Colt, you're really good at making these TikTok videos and these, you know, Instagram memes. I go, I got a couple million followers. Why don't you start making those for me? 
and I'll pay your allowance for that because that's what you excel at. And by the way, you might want to make your bed and do some of the stuff around the house and call it contribution for living the lifestyle you did. And the second we change that paradigm, everything changed for that kid. So now when he comes up to me and he wants new tennis shoes or he wants a new Fortnite skin, he comes up and says, hey, dad, how many TikTok videos can I make for you to get this? And he's doing what he excels and thrives at. And by doing that, he's teaching other kids to do the same. You know, I remember I was listening to um, Pitbull and he was talking about being raised by his mom who would have him listen to Tony Robbins. And he said he became who he is because his mom had him listening to Tony Robbins. I feel like as much as we have these conversations with our kid, kids, the reason your son is as extraordinary is he's being raised in your house. He's listening to this language. He's listening to paradigm shifts. Like my son said to me the other day, that person probably should, should shift their paradigm. They're, they're stuck in <laughs> what? And so they are listening. And one of the things I, would, I was having my daughter do is listen to mindset work. But she was annoying as all hell. So now she draws while she's listening. And, and I was like, you're an artist. I had no idea you knew how to draw. So all of these things we're bringing home to our children and they're listening to what we're really not just saying, but doing in our life. And I think what I love about Secret Knock is everything that you're doing, you're living is now moving on to all of us. So what, how did secret not come about for you? Like what, how did you start? Yeah. It, it, it's so a, a double edge on that one. So again, I, as you and I mentioned uh, before this call, I've got the greatest ex-wife in the world. Her and I are so close. Her boyfriend's amazing. They're it's a great spirit. So I'm not alone in this one. My, you know, Alan is raising Colt alongside. We're great co-parents. So we have to give her both you know, credit and uh, accolades for that. And that's how Secret Knock came to be. Many years ago, when I was writing all these books, people said, how can I meet your friends that you're meeting along the way? And so what happened is I started an event in my living room and people started coming and telling other people and it grew exponentially. And the whole idea was just to share secrets. It wasn't to, you know, hold anything back. It seems like all these, all these, I'll be careful, many of these gurus out there, what they would do is poke a sore spot. And then just for 1995, run in the back of the room with your credit card, they'll fix that for you. And we said, wouldn't it be cool if we just said, hey, here's a secret. Here's, here's what we learned. I'll, I'll give you one right now. Whenever you go on stage, and this is what Les Brown taught me, by the way. So this is good because you, 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 you doused my memory here and he called earlier. Uh, when you go on stage, the background is almost always a black curtain. And if you wear a black suit, like most people do, you look like a dancing head on that curtain. So I started wearing different colored outfits. Look, no big deal. Just a little bit different. Blue, red, green, just a little bit tone. And what happens? I pop off the back of the backdrop. And I realized all of a sudden people felt they were connecting with me, not because I was saying anything different, just because I was disassociating with the background. And then Les told me a great line. He says, look, most people that are new, they hold a microphone like this. And they put it like this and have a conversation. He goes, look at this. You're blocking your face. He goes, what I do is I hold the end of a microphone and then I hold it out here and I still have a conversation. I still have the microphone working, but people are still feeling connected. So by popping off the screen and doing this one simple action, I go from here and blending in to now sticking out and communicating. Did you have to take classes to learn how to speak on stage or did that come naturally to you? Because you happen to be amazing at it. No, I just ask great people. I, again, it was, it was, here's a secret, everyone. Surround yourself with people that are getting the results you want. Stop asking these Instagram gurus, you know, what to do when they haven't done it themselves, right? There's nothing more frustrating, like Steve Sims says, to ask someone how to do stage, stage presentations that's never been on a stage. So the whole idea is I just kept seeking out people that were the highest excel artists in each one of their chosen fields of endeavor and ask them what they did and then i started duplicating it for myself and when people speak on stage the most successful people i'll give you guys a, a little tip how it works songs just like a music a song has a beginning a middle a hook a melody and an end and they're about two minutes long rather than practice a 60 minute presentation i do one song at a time and by mastering that song I got into my blueprint. And when I go do a presentation, wherever it is, I do a hit list, a song list before I go out on stage. And those are the songs I'll sing. I'll give you an example of one right now. One of my favorite interviews was with this guy named Steve Wozniak, who started Apple Computer. 
And I asked him, I said, how did you and Jobs have so much success in your life? He said, that's easy. He goes, we embraced our lack. I go, what? He goes, yeah, we embraced what we did not have. We didn't run from it. We ran toward it. I go, give me an example. He said, when these little microchip processor things came out, he said, they were very expensive. He goes, we could only afford one. He goes, job sold his car. I sold my calculator. We pulled our money to buy one of these little magical devices. He goes, but IBM and Hewlett Packard, they didn't make machines that go from point A to point B. And they'd have 20 of these chips because they had all the money of God. He said, so I'd pull away five and I go from A to B with 15. I'd pull away five, get it to work with 10. Eventually, I found a way to go from A to B using our one chip. He goes, we were not trying to be innovative or cool or aerodynamic. Or He goes, we could afford one chip. He goes, but by embracing that as an opportunity, we found the shortest, cleanest path. And by doing that, we changed the way people do personal computing for the rest of the world for the rest of their life. He said, where could you be right now in your own business if you stop looking at something as your greatest challenge and obstacle? It could just be your greatest blessing and opportunity in disguise. All right. So there's a song, beginning, middle, end, hook, melody, boom, right? So I mastered that st story, that song. And so now when I go out on stage and I have an hour presentation, they say, hey, we're running behind. You only got 15 minutes. No problem. I'll just do my three greatest hits. <laughs> right? It doesn't make a difference. And every time someone puts a microphone in my face and a camera and says, tell us about something, I got a song for it. And that's how the most successful people are, look like they're always prepared. That speaks volumes, doesn't it? Like, because that I remember hearing you say that, and I was like, "Oh my god!" It, it was somebody just giving me the blueprint to life. Well, because it's it's, it's it, for speaking. <laughs> it's pretty pretty good stuff. I'm I'm telling, really different here, here's how it gets complicated. Different color jacket. Hold the microphone. Tell a song. There you go. Ta -da! That's the way it works. And that's what we want to make secret knock, where when people come up, you don't need 90 minutes to tell what I just told. Boom, boom, boom. And so what it is, is a series of amazing people coming out saying, this is how it works. This is how the movie industry works. This is how TV works. This is how business works. And by doing that, you leave with a juggernaut of information. So good. So you're around some of the most brilliant human beings on this planet. So while everyone's talking about the sky is falling, we're going through a recession, life is about to like be traumatic. Can you speak into that? Like, what would you say to someone who's ready to be panicked? Well, if you believe it is, then th I, that is, I mean, I, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a therapist. I write books and make movies, right? I'm just a regular cat, normal guy. I just choose what I put into my ears. And it reminds me of another song, but I think it's relevant to tell. And I don't think you've ever heard this song, so it'll be new to you. I remember I interviewed a gal named uh, Debbie Fields. She opened a company called Mrs. Fields Cookies. So you, back in the day, we'd go to the mall, they'd always give you the samples. And I said, how is it that this came to be? And she said, when she was 14, her mom would make her food every single night. And, but her mom's food wasn't very good. And one day she decided to boycott. And the mom says, you can eat that meal. And Debbie said, no. And mom says, well, you can't leave the table till you eat the meal. Came back two hours. You can eat that meal. Debbie said, no. Nope. Midnight rolls around. Debbie, you can eat your meal. She said, no. The mom said, fine. I'll never cook for you again a day in your life. And Debbie Field said, excellent. That worked right in my program because it was horrible. She takes all the babysitting money, goes to the store, buys ingredients, cooks dinner the next night. The family loves it along with a batch of cookies. So much so that the neighbors hear about it and at age 19 opens up her first franchise called Mrs. Fields Cookies, where later in life sells for a half a billion dollars. And I said, so basically your mom's a role model for you. <laughs> She's your inspiration. And she goes, indirectly, yeah. She goes, when I opened the franchise, she told me not to do it. I'm a failure. I'm a loser. I'm a woman. And I'd fall on my face. And then she said something that was absolutely mind boggling to me. She said, Greg, in this world, we have two sides. One side's called the cheering section. These are the people that root us on and tell us we'll succeed. To the other side is a bigger group. They're the jeering section. They boo, rain on our parade and tell us every reason we'll fail and not succeed. She goes, it's up to us as a grown adult to stand in between those two groups 
and then decide for ourselves which ones we actually listen to. Powerful, powerful. So I'm going to ask one more question. I'm going to open it up to everybody else because I know we've got a lot of people who are dying to get connect with you. Who was your favorite interview that you've done that literally blew your mind in your life? Yeah, it's like picking your favorite child. And, and I know you've heard this one before, but I, it comes down to it. It came from a poet and a philosopher and a wordsmith named Evander Holyfield, the old boxing legend. And I didn't see it coming. And I said, Evander, I go, how did you win so many heavyweight championships? And he said, that's easy. I have a higher standard. He goes, in sports, I showed up early, left late, invented exercises. I had a higher standard. and I won more championships. I said, didn't it hurt being in a fight? He says, yeah, but when you're in a fight, you don't focus on the pain. You don't focus on the blows. As soon as you do, you end up on your back knocked out. But that's what people do outside the ring. They focus on gas prices and war economy. And he goes, they wonder why they never become a champion in their own right. And he pulled me in tight. An Adonis of a man missing half an ear bitten off by Mike Tyson. He said, the funny thing is when you do win the championship, he says, everyone comes to their feet and they chant your name. They raise your hand in victory and a guy puts a big shiny belt around your waist. He said, at that moment and at that second, you won't feel even one of the punches you took along the journey. But the guy in the losing locker room will have every bruise, every excuse for the rest of their life wishing they had a higher standard. Mm, that is so good. In so many levels of so many areas of life, you can take that. Thank you. So I'm going to open it up to everyone else because I know if it was up to me, we'd be here till next week and I would keep asking Greg questions. Um, who would like to start? Well, right here is a chat. So exciting. Hey, Shannon Banana. Go for it, Joseph. I'm, I'm going to ask you to unmute. I had you muted, Joseph. You have to unmute. Joseph, unmute, please. You have to unmute, my darling. <laughs> yeah, I need those glasses too, Joseph. I'm right there with you, brother. You can call me Joey. You can call me Joey. Hey, Joey. Yeah. Hey, Joey. Hey, hold on. Let me help you get that. Th All right, there you go. When, when you say song, do you mean literally a song title or you mean a theme? Well, what I just did. So let's just use Evander Holyfield. So to me, that's a song. It's a two minute story. Okay. I I got a beginning, a middle, an end, and a crescendo, and I wrap it all up. Okay. Right. So that, that's your term for that. Energy. That's what I call. And then what I do is before I go on stage, if you ever see me speak, you'll notice that I'll take a piece of paper. And then what I'll do is I'll write on my there my set list. And so what happens is that it'll be on the floor and what I'm doing there, I'll tell the Hey, remember to tell the Evander story. Hey, tell the Remax story. Hey, tell this story. And so that it doesn't matter like, about the audience that's listening to it. You're, you're just doing your own song list. I'm doing and, my song list, but then they have I, to I, dig it or not. Well, not only that, but I usually will tell the stories that are framed towards the audience. Obviously. Okay, so okay, okay. That's the idea. And if so, if I'm in the real estate, I may tell some of my real estate stories. If I'm into yeah. sports, I'll tell the sports stories. Okay. If I'm into you know, personal development, I'll tell those stories. So I have hundreds of stories or songs. So that way, no matter what it is, the venue, I've always got something for it. All right. That's cool. Great question. You Good job, Joey. Anyone else have anything for me? How do I keep my hair looking this good? Louis? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm losing out on clients with all these really good looking shaved heads. I'm telling you, <laughs> pretty easy now. It's pretty easy stuff. All Nick, right. I'm going to pick so. on Tara. You get to ask a question, Miss Tara. Miss, hold on. You've got to show him your tattoo, as a matter of fact. Oh, I think I showed Greg my tattoo. Where's it at? You can kind of see it. Well, no, no, I there. can't see an SK an test, SK it's like right. It's literally like right here, so that you. I saw yours, but yeah, we see right we're, here. We're, we're there. I can see it. I'm not supposed to have any hand tattoos, but I'm like, you know what? That one's really powerful to me, in order to make me show up every day and be accountable to my goals and not let them fall wayside because I have a 
a history of doing that. So my story really resonated with, um, I can't remember her name, but I remember Sunshine. And she was the one who came on stage and she shared about how she believed all the people that told her she listened to the naysayers, the crabs, you know, and that was my story too. And so I really, I was thinking earlier today, I'm like, I need to message her, send her a voice message, a video message, like Steve Sims told us and just tell her how powerful her story was for me personally. So I, I hope you do. Her name's Linda Sunshine West. And Linda, Linda L-Y. I can always find her by Sunshine, but I can't exactly. Yeah. So. And I took a picture. I'm going to send that to her later saying that you said that. So that's pretty awesome. And thank oh, you for joining the tribe. And for people that are new, uh, we did a thing for a short term that if anyone got our logo tattooed on their body, uh, they can come to Secret Knock for Life. We didn't think anyone would do it. <laughs> there was a line at the door of people tattooing themselves. I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> it's like we're going to get some type of cult going over here. I don't know. That's kind of weird. But it's, it's pretty neat. We all did it. <laughs> now, I've never had a tattoo in my entire life, and even I considered it. I was- yeah, it's, it's, it's I, me too. This is the first one I ever did. So it's pretty cool. So thank you very much. Thank you. So Tara actually signs up for Secret Knock shortly before it's about to start. And then after she's paid, she's ready to go. She calls me. She goes, what's Secret Knock? And I was like, I seriously love you. She was like, good to go. Had Other than my excitement for it, she signs up and goes, all right. So now I got to tell my kid he's got to watch the dog. But I have no idea where I'm going. What's the story? (laughs) So back in the day, there was a TV show called Seinfeld. And one of the episodes was George Costanza opposite day. And I realized that everyone that was doing these live events would have a banner, a flyer and little circles with heads in there. And they'd show the same speakers and what you'd learn. And I said, well, what if we did an event where we don't tell you where it is or who will be there? George Costanza opposite day. That's how it all came to be. And so what we did is we turned everything on its, its tail so we started an event that costs a lot of money to attend, and we don't tell people where it is or who will be there. We just tell them the city, state, and the date so they can make travel. And then right before, we leak the secret location. But by doing that, we can bring in amazing people. We've had a private Skype with Edward Snowden while he's hiding in Russia. Uh, you know, We've had everyone from President Vicente Fox come in and tell us how George Bush tried to trick him to go to war. We had Carol Baskin from the Tiger King tell her side of the story. And this last one, we were supposed to have a major keynote speaker, but we couldn't because there was a threat on our life because of all the drama going in the media. But it was very interesting how we can start attracting these amazing thought leaders that most people can never have access to. I think it's so powerful. What I knock for K N O C K. What does that mean? I, I, secret I, knock? Yeah, the knock. Bump, but a bump, 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 bump. I don't know. So uh, <laughs> the, the concept was originally when. People came, it was 12 people in my living room and they go, do I need a ticket? I said, you don't need a ticket. Just do the secret knock as a joke. And it took off and became kind of what it is today. All right, Kevin and David got questions. Go for it, Kevin. All right. So, um, Greg, what do you believe sets successful entrepreneurs apart from those who struggle to achieve their goals? Great question. Stickability, the power to persevere. First, there's a dream, then there's a challenge, and then comes victory. Most people quit in their challenging times. And the definition of success is going from setback to setback without the loss of enthusiasm. And most people lose that fire and that dream because they're doing something they're passionate about, but not necessarily something they love. And so passion wears off, but that love will last forever. So the big secret is to find something that you truly love and you're going to do with call, you know, your commitment and have stickability that nothing and no one can get in the way. Thanks. Great question, Kevin. Yeah. By the way, I don't know if you guys ever seen it. I'll show you something kind of cool. Um, I, ugh, since I'm here at the house, when, when you do a book, you do something called a query letter. It says who you are, what's your message, why an expert who's going to read your book. I was turned down by 268 publishers for my first book. Again, everything I told you, dyslexic, can't spell. 
I'm not making that up. It's true. And so this, since I'm home, you can see these are all my rejection letters. <laughs> these are all the people that told me I could never be an author. And here we are now. It's a completely different paradigm, as they'd say. And what's interesting in that first book I did was called The Millionaire Mentor. And one quote from that book was shared 37 million times. And you've all seen it. You just didn't know it was my quote. It says, a dream written down with a date becomes a goal. A goal broken into steps becomes a plan. A plan backed by action makes your dreams come true. All the t-shirts, bumper stickers, coffee mugs you've seen with my quote came from a book that was turned down 260 times flat. And the moral of the story is never let another person or yourself talk you out of what you know to be true. Yes, yes. Awesome. David Reed. Well, my, you know, Greg, my question is actually kind of regarding your, your authorship in your book, but with that answer, you just made me think of another question. And with that quote that you said, what was the goal that you wrote down that you are referring to that became part of that book? What was it that you, what was that goal? So what did I you write a, down? Yeah. When I was a kid, when I was like 17, something like that, I wrote a bucket list and I had 80 just impossible things on that uh, list and just they're impossible. And so it was one of those bucket list items. Okay. And so uh, it really didn't make a difference how many people told me, no, I was going to do it no matter what. I just didn't know how. And finally, after I was getting turned down, turned down, turned down, I reached out to some of the publishers and I said, look, I know you're not going to do my book. Gloves off. No problem. We're friends. I would teach me at least give me a lesson. I go, what is it that I'm doing wrong? And they go, man, your writing sucks. It's all over the place. It's a disaster. You need a ghostwriter. And I went, oh my Lord. So what I did is I sat someone down and I would give them the concept and then they'd recraft it. So for example, I go, okay, I'm, here's my book. A boy wants a bicycle. He gets off his ass. He mows lawns, makes money, buys a bike. And it came back to me from my ghostwriter it was a glorious Sunday afternoon when a young bright eyed lad caught the entrepreneurial <laughs> spirit and they recrafted it. So then I understood the power of you work your strengths and you hire or you align with your weaknesses. And by doing that, all of a sudden, all the doors of opportunity started you know, swinging open. I didn't work at something I struggled at. I worked my strengths and I aligned with the things that I, you know, could had some challenges with. Awesome. So my next question is kind of a follow up and it's going to be really hard for you to answer, but I just, and it goes with something Louisa said about, you know, your favorite interview, but you've written a number of books and you've had these concepts and what book maybe besides the first one, are you most connected with and which one was the hardest one for you to get through to write? Well, three feet from gold was our biggest, you know, quote unquote success slash best book or however you want to look at it. And it was the hardest one to do. And it was, the most profitable and it was the one that was shared the most many times. So uh, what happened was there's this book that was written a hundred years ago called think and grow rich by this guy named Napoleon Hill. And what happened is he was given a letter of introduction by a guy named Carnegie to go meet his friends and write the Bible of personal development. Well, a hundred years later to the date, the Napoleon Hill family and foundation gave me the same type letter. And so I have a ticket to meet any human alive. And so I write the Think and Grow Rich series through Napoleon Hill Foundation. And when this book came out, I was not turned down by every publisher in New York. They just canceled their appointments and never met with me. They said, look, who the heck are you to fall in this guy's, who, what you, who gives you the right, right? And I, justifiably, by the way. And so what happened is I ended up calling the Napoleon Hill Foundation like I did the publisher and said, what am I missing? And the same thing, they go, you don't need a ghostwriter, you need a co-author. So they introduced me to Sharon Lecter, who wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad with Kiyosaki. We came together and did this book. But here's where it gets really powerful. You see, what happened was we went directly to the source. You see, there's one bookstore left in America called Barnes & Noble. And every author, their goal is to get into this bookstore. So we booked an appointment with the owners of Barnes and Noble, and we did a joint venture where we said, we'll bypass all the royalty up front, all the advances, and why don't we do this as a collaboration? So this was the first book in history that was actually published by Barnes and Noble and their sister company. And by doing so, who had a bigger email list? <laughs> mm -hmm. Barnes and Noble. 
And that alliance is what opened up the doors, which became what it is today. That is great. Thank you. So Greg, I have a question because I get asked this all the time. What, hold on, I pinned this in. I took Greg out and uh, put David in for a pin. Hang on. I'm good. I can see everything. I know, but I, uh, uh, there you go. I want to highlight you. Okay. So people ask me this all the time. How do you get these extraordinary people on your mastermind? So what had you say yes to me to be on here today? Oh, because you and I are friends, number one. And door number two, you did something very spectacular that most people will not do. And you asked, you reached out. And as you know, the most powerful and successful people are also the most available and easy people. And that's an anomaly that most people can't comprehend. Uh, you know, if you're brand new at something, you're happy, go lucky, you're fresh, you're cool. If you're at the top of your field, you're happy, go lucky, you got nothing to prove. When you're in the middle, that's where you're filled with ego. You're edging God out. You're finding your own voice. So the secret is doing what you're doing and you jump to the front of the line and say, mm-hmm. who is getting the results that I want? Who's hanging out, doing the things that I want to do and reach out to those people. Here's one thing you do that's spectacular. You surround yourself with people you have respect for, not people you have influence over. And that's the difference that separates you from the 95% who just dream of success to the top 5% who make it come to life. Absolutely. I remember when I was, um, before I started interviewing anyone, one of the, the, the moment before I asked my first question to anybody, I said, I pray to God, anyone that connects with me and says yes to me, that we allow for both voices to get heard and for the world to be impacted by the difference that gets made from that connection. Beautiful. And it really has impacted every, I mean, my very first time I asked anyone to speak was the, it was a huge influencer. And I was like, who in their right mind goes to a huge influencer who's never, I've never asked anyone to speak before. And I was like, would you be on my interview? And she said, yes. And I was like, Okay. And then I thought, well, if she said yes, she probably believes I could do this. So I think I have it. And it yes. like going from there. So what I don't know what on earth I was thinking of going straight here first. So what is your experience of like where to position yourself of like building the experience first and then going big or just kind of going for it? Just going for it. And, and here's the big secret for people. Okay, again, here's the secret. That they're so simple. Specificity. And I know I dyslexic and not saying it right, but you be specific. It works like this. No one wants to go to lunch with you. No one wants to have dinner. No one wants a brain pick. No one wants coffee. But here's what you do is you sit there and let's say I want to get to the founder of Remax Real Estate. I'm going to say, hey, Dave, I'm asking for 12.5 minutes of your time. That's it. I'll cover all my own costs and expense to come see you. From the moment I open the door till the time I leave will be 12 and a half minutes. I'll start a stopwatch. I'm going to ask you one simple question, X, Y, Z. What's the chance of him coming from the office down to the break room to do that? Pretty damn high because it's very specific. It's the same thing if I get off stage and there's a thousand people and there's a line of people want autographs and pictures. It's awesome. They say the nicest things. How can I be of contribution? How can I be of service? I don't have 30 minutes for a resume check. Compare that to someone who pops up and says, hey, I went to your Instagram. I saw you got a bunch of followers. I make really cool memes. Let me send you one. If you like it, maybe you'll use me. Eight seconds. I know who you are, what you do. You have my cell phone and we're in contact. That's the only thing I do different. And that's what I reach out to people constantly. And that's how we fill up our events today. I hope everybody realizes like every single thing you do is exactly everything you said is exactly what you do. And I swear to God, I have like listened to every word I have tried to like implement it in my life every which way I can. And it works. So I I am forever grateful for the way that you share, because I have to tell you, I learned something on the last secret, not from you too. Do you want to hear what it is? Let's hear it. I had no idea that Greg Reed goes onto Instagram and connects with new people. Like you would think that we're all his evangelists and everybody goes off and does what Greg Reed, um, like sits back and just plays pool. That's what I thought. But no, he actually 
like reaches out to people on Instagram and meets new people and invites them back to this tribe. I had no idea. So I was like, constantly. And I do something called, this is interesting, contact roulette. I recommend everyone do that. Open up your phone to contacts and go like this, go and stop it. Whoever that is, send them a text and say, hey, it's sending you a drive by high all the way from the mean streets of Carlsbad, California. And they go, zoo, zoo, do it three times. You will start connecting. If you did that every single day, you'll start connecting with your old high school friends, uh, you know, people you haven't seen in years, family members. Um, it's mind boggling because you're not doing any work. You're just reaching out. So I'm constantly doing that on a daily basis. And that's how you're meeting new people. But you're also staying in contact with people that you met along the way. It's such gold because it really isn't just about like, here's a little window of our life together. It really is a lifetime of relationships. That's and right. that's why you have beautiful relationships. That's right. All right. Well, I got four more minutes. Is there any last thing I can do for you? Who has a burning desire for a question? Go for it, Tara. I finally have my question. When is the next book coming out? The personal development book that I know is going to be lit Yes. So we're starting that journey tomorrow, as a matter of fact. So it'll be out for the next secret knock. Uh, My goal is to have a book signing and a whole release party for it at that time. And I realized that no one's ever really written the definitive book on personal development. So I've got a mastermind group that's going along with me. And what we're going to do is do a deep dive into this. And we also are doing one. It's called The Secret of Happiness. And for the last couple of years, I've had this group and we've interviewed so many amazing people to find out what the secret of happiness is. And we keep getting these different answers. And I'll be frank with you. I thought it was going to be a slam dunk deal. Like, oh, this is the secret definitive at the end and write this book. But every time we go down the rabbit hole, we kept finding a new discovery. And so I've been picking my brain of how to tell this story to get it up in the best way. And I think we got a grasp of it. We're a few chapters in and it's spectacular. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's one of the most exciting projects I got going on the horizon. And in June, we're going to film a little documentary short, uh, 18 minute. And then we're going to hopefully put out all the film festivals around the world and inspire people to find their happiness as well. Such a great question, Tara, because I literally was like, how do we support you? What are you doing? And that question took it right there. Do you have um, one last moment for Mary Frances to ask a question? Then we could. Oh, ah, well, Mary Frances is part of my happiness crew. So there you go. <laughs> that, that, that worked out well. Yeah. As a matter of fact, hi, Mary Frances. Hey, no, secret of happiness, honestly, has just been, you know, it, it's been a joyful rabbit hole. Like you say, just every time we turn around, it goes a different direction. I'm so glad that I partnered in and and took this with you. But I, you said something earlier, and I just want to ask you, because you were corrected on the stage at Secret Knock. How do you pronounce your wife's name? Now it's a Lynn. It always was. Yeah. <laughs> well, she didn't go by it. She, so I only know her as Alan. And, and, but the real way to say it is a Lynn. And so she's like changing her name like Prince. So I'm trying to get used to the new way of saying it. So that's, yeah. I love you both so much. <laughs> and so, so real quick, I'll tell you guys one of these things about Secret of Happiness. When we're doing this journey, I, so you guys see both sides of it. I thought for sure the answer was, and this was the answer. The Secret of Happiness is a subtractive equation and not an addition equation. Mic drop, the end, that's the answer. Meaning that every time you add a car, a house, a boyfriend, that doesn't find happiness. But every time you subtract shame, guilt, remorse, toxicity, you do find happiness. Pretty simple. I go, done. And then I was interviewing a gal from Mexico. And she goes, well, you're just a pompous, arrogant person thinking that. I said, again, teach me. And she goes, well, think about it. She goes, where I'm from in my village, we've been saving for generations to apply for visas to come into America. And I was the first person to get through. She goes, when I bought my first car through the credit with my FICO score, she goes, you would have thought that I won a gold medal (laughs) back home because I got out alive and I actually proved that I'm living the American dream. They go, they celebrated me like I was literally an astronaut returning to Earth. And she goes, it gave hope to my entire community of all that's possible. He goes, but you guys have so much that you can get rid of stuff 
because you have an abundance. But the people that are lacking by adding to it gives them a hope of what can be. So I said, fair enough, right? So every time we go down this thing, we go, yeah, we're good. Mic drop, let's write this book. And we go, holy shit, that's not the answer. And so we kept going back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. And it, it's interesting. Like, I'll give you another example. We'd sit there and say, okay, happiness is an inside job. Who's ever heard that, right? It's all up to you. If it's going to be, it's going to be up to me and all this cliche stuff. And we thought that. We go, okay, it's gratitude. It's owning a thing. Then we talked to this monk. And the monk goes, no, it goes, it's called happiness dependence. I go, what's that? He goes, happiness is dependent on other things and other people. I go, well, that goes against what we thought. He says, well, let's just say you got a raise at work, $200,000 to give you a brand new Mercedes Benz, a Rolex watch, corner office, and you drive home to tell the family. As soon as you open the door, you're fired up and the wife's screaming and she's crying and the two kids or they're on fire. And over here he goes, your happiness is gone instantly. He goes, so your happiness is dependent upon other people. And I went, okay, <laughs> regroup. So this book has been a set, reset, re set, reset along the journey. So now we're going to tell it in this really cool parable format where we can show both sides and the reader can make up their own decision which way they, they want it to be. This is good. This is good. Yeah, it's, it's, it really is good. And it's interesting. I couldn't figure out why it's taken me so long because I'm a pretty quick guy. And I think I just really wanted to do it right. And more importantly, I, I'm, I'm hoping this will inspire other people. And a good author writes about what they need help with, too. I'm a pretty happy guy, but how do you do it? And how do you stay positive? And how did you handle the adversities that came your way? Um, so anyway, that's what we're on. I got to fly. It was a privilege being with you. Hi, everybody. If there's anything I can do, be a contribution, okay. let me know. Um, we love you, Greg. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brian, Greg. Brian just got on. Dude, you missed out. We told you where the aliens were hiding, Bigfoot, everything. Bomber, you'll have to tune in next time to get that answer. See you later. Have the most beautiful evening.